Thank you. Welcome back on stage, Hi, hi, Jim. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Come on, have a seat. Um, After hearing about NASA.io yesterday, I want to talk to Alex a little bit about community in general, because I think we've talked a lot about community over the past day and a half. It is such an important part of reviving old brands. It's such an important part of, as a creator, building out what you do and expanding it. But as a brand and as a company, having a community as well is super important. I don't think that that is as well understood as probably it should be. So I agree. let's talk really quickly about community and private community. We've got communities, CompuServe, AOL, et cetera. What's new now and why should brands be interested in building their own communities? Yeah, so Jim, I think communities have been an important part of the internet since its establishment. When you talked about AOL and others, right? And I think that you know, in the early days, the way that communities were being built was often around building software and your early users and trying to get feedback. But actually, as social media has evolved, I think we've seen communities using, being used in different ways. So you can get, uh, communities can be a way to engage new customers, right? Communities can be a way to engage different brands in your portfolio. Communities can be a way if you have, let's say, different apps or different products to, to work with them. And so I think what's happened is there are lots of different use cases to build deeper connections, either with your internal or external customers. And then the question is, how do you do that? And I think that what's changed over the last two years is that you know, in the past, we were relying a lot on Facebook ads and Google ads in order to reach people. But things have changed, right? Apple changed its privacy rules, yep. and now it's harder to target people. And so the return on the, the amount of money you spend is, is getting lower. So brands are starting to think, OK, how else can I reach different people? And what we're seeing is that communities is a really powerful way to do that. And we can discuss it a bit more. Yeah. But I think that's why we're seeing this kind of push towards it. In the well, last so I, years. And I'm a brand and I create a community. First of all, that's a big leap of faith that I would actually bring in my top customers or people who may not be to be part of that community because you're sort of letting go, right? Yeah. So it is a mindset shift. So there are two ways that a brand can think about a community. They could say, I have, let's say I have a, an email list of a million people. And I want to engage the top 1%. And I want to build deeper connections with them. And I want to do more activities with them. I want to do more activations. And I want to educate them. That's one approach. The other approach is to say, I'm actually going to target people who are not yet in my, my, my customer list. I'm not yet in my brand. And we've seen some really interesting examples of that, which is, like for example, Lululemon, one of the brands that are well-loved in, in the fitness space. Their view is actually, I want you to build a deep connection with my brand before you buy something. So what I think is you care about lifestyle, you care about fitness. So I'm going to give you opportunities to learn about fitness, to take part in classes at my store without even buying any merch, right? And then through that connection, in my, you, you form part of the Lululemon community, you will start liking my brand more, you'll start understanding my brand more, and then you will eventually buy. So it's fascinating. It's not just about super fans and trying to build a community of that. It's, it's around people who have maybe not even considered your brand yet, right? Absolutely. So another interesting example that I saw was the idea of a milk company, right? A company that sells milk. And they were saying, okay, I want to do a community. So you'd say, okay, well, who's going to be interested in a community about milk? Well, maybe not many people. But what was interesting is they said, well, what if we took that, uh, look at our target customer, which is moms, right? And let me build a community for moms, like, we will build it, but it'll be all about how I can help moms, right? So it could be things around how I support my child, activities. It could be about learning and development. It could be about nutrition, right? And then it's the brand who's building that around, engaging the target customer with a view that I can eventually, later on the line, sell them things. Does the brand put, when the community is first built, do people know that that brand is behind it or is it just a community around it where the brand is in the background? So I think there are two different ways, and we've seen two different ways we can do this. The first way is to say the brand creates a community. Um, So we use the milk example. Imagine Nestle's Mm -hmm. community for moms, and then they can build it around that way. But the other interesting way is to say, actually, there are thousands of mom communities that exist online. They could exist on Facebook. They could exist on Discord, right? What if, as a brand, I go and sponsor that community, right, and activate within that community? And it's interesting, I was chatting to, to actually to Netflix, and they said with Korean dramas, one of the interesting they, things they do now is they go to the Philippines and they find interesting Facebook groups who are super fans around Korean dramas, and they actually sponsor those groups and do activities, activations within them. 
So why that's interesting, uh, both for creators and for brands, is that I think the community manager has been a really underserved category of creator. You could build Facebook groups with thousands or even hundreds of thousands of members, but there's not really many ways to monetize that. Right? There isn't a way to, to earn through ads. Right? You could do all these different resources and activities. You can't do subscription. Right? But today, as brands think more about communities, the actual community manager can earn a really good living. Right? And we can go into the different platforms I think we were going to discuss, but, but I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Well, real quickly, let's talk about getting started. And, and community manager, I agree, is an underappreciated role. But how do you as a brand or as a creator build a community and find a good community manager? And then we can talk about platforms that make that easier or harder. Yeah, so I think that if a brand wants to build a community, they have to have a, uh, switch their mindset. When you think about ads, Facebook ads, for example, what I think is I push a button, I spend X dollars, and I'll reach you know, 100,000 people, a million people. Community is the opposite. Community is bottoms up. So what I have to start thinking about is my first community events may not be about getting 10,000 people in them. Can I get my first 100? 100 people who just really care. They're going to show up. They're going to attend the events. They're going to find value. So it's all community building for brands is all about providing value, not thinking about transactions. Right. Yep. That's a big shift. Because if a brand builds it saying, OK, when am I going to get my first sale? You'll build it very differently by saying, can I just provide value? Right. So when you build a community as a brand, I'd say you start with your first 100. You then think about how to get to 200, 300, 400, 500, and beyond. And think about it over a six-month time frame. If in six months you have 1,000 people deeply engaged attend majority of your events, come into your community multiple times a week. Think about your percentage engagement on your social media. Maybe less than 1% engaged, right? So that's the equivalent of 100,000 followers. And that's how I think brands need right. to think about yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good metric to use. Uh, how about platforms? I mean, obviously, you guys just launched NOS.io. There's Discord. There are other, there's Facebook groups and other places. Does the, does the place where you build the community matter? That's a great question. So I think that where you build your community has to be where your target audience likes to live. So if I'm into gaming, Discord may be my best bet because the gamers are already there. If I'm a community of moms in the Philippines, we know that Facebook group is the, like, the, the, the best channel. So I think the difference in platforms out there is there are platforms that help brands build communities and they say, build everything in our platform. Build the chat build the engagement. And we don't think that's actually the way that brands should build communities in the future. We think they should go to where they are, but they should have additional tools and resources and support and analytics to help them build it well in Facebook, in Discord, in WhatsApp. So that's where we're slightly different. But I would advise, you know, just to be, to, for brands to say, well, look, look at your goals, look at your objectives, and find the best platform for you. I think that's the most important. Yeah, when we were building VidCon's Discord server out, it was just so hard for me to find people who are experts there who could help do it and build it and manage it. And you know, we saw a huge growth at one point and then things dropped off and ended up building someone internally, but it was a long process. Yeah, it's, it's hard actually because if you go on LinkedIn today and you search community manager or community operations, in different companies it means different things. It could mean customer support person. It could mean building community. It could mean social media manager. So that's a problem, the community manager definition, like title, is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, what one thing we're trying to do is actually build a global network of community managers to give access to brands. Right. And I think that's one way to solve it. But I think if a brand's looking for a community manager, go into a community that's relevant for you that you like, connect with the community manager, either try to hire them or ask for a recommendation. Cool. Well, I'm going to invite Steve back up. We're going to talk a little bit about the future of the creator economy. As he comes up and we get him a chair out here, one last question for you sure. about community. What's the one or two tips you can give to brands or other people who want to start a community next year? What's the one thing, like, keep this in mind. It may not be obvious, but it's really important. So I think the first thing is don't try to sell your product. Right. Most imp that's the biggest thing I see brands getting wrong. All right. Don't try to sell your so, so provide value to them. Provide value. One last one, and I saw this with, look, with blogs, there were blogs for babies that came out, and then J&J, &J, big company, bought one of the biggest ones, yeah. being the biggest help for when I, my kid was small, which I thought was really smart. Are we going to see people building communities that get acquired? I think so. Yeah? I think in 2023 we're seeing, I've seen a couple of examples already, 
and I'm excited to see that happen. Yeah, so if you're building community, connect with brands. Right, That's and, then, and then perhaps you can get it acquired as well. I think it's really yeah. interesting. Okay, both you guys, super smart, been in the industry a long time, doing really, really interesting things. Let's start out, we're gonna spend a couple minutes just looking at some different trends. Um, looking ahead to 2023, what are you most excited about, Steve? I'm most excited about, Whoa. is that working? You're Hello? Good. You're good, okay. you're good, keep I'm going. I'm most excited about all the different, uh, I guess, uh, ways that uh, different platforms are monetizing shorts, actually, or, or short-form content. I Shorts think there's, monetization, there's a, there's a yeah. huge dynamic shift with, with Facebook, with TikTok, with YouTube, uh, and other platforms around how they're monetizing short-form. So I think that's going to be a pretty interesting thing to see moving forward. Alex, what are you most excited about about 23? So I think 21, 2020 to 2022, there was a lot of hype and money in the creator economy. What I'm excited about is I think the people who are providing real value, the creators really onto something in their niche, this is their time to shine. Right? And that's going to be very different. We're going to separate the hype from the real, I think, the people who are providing value. So I think those who have a specific niche are going to have a really big opportunity to Time to start it. building real businesses and channels. I think exactly. that's good. Okay. We're going to go to you first, Alex. What creator economy trend do you think is incorrect or overhyped for next year? I think that there is too much focus on the top 1%. So we talk about Mr. Beast, for yeah, example. Right. right? People look at Mr. Beast and say, oh, because Mr. Beast can do it, I can do it. Right? And I think you know, with food, that's a really good example. Right? Just because Mr. Beast Burger can do 1,000 outlets, it doesn't mean that someone with 100,000 can do it. Right. Right? So I think like, what, what we need to do is focus less on the top 1% and focus more on the mid-tier. Mid All right, Steve, what's incorrect, overhyped? People are looking at a trend for next year. Um, what's been overhyped? <clears throat> that's a hard one to say, really. Um, I, I think, <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the genre specific areas, you know, people are trying to go in really broad areas, like, for example, going into food or pastry mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. But definitely the hyper niche, I think, is going to be one of the most exciting things moving forward. So if you're going to go into you know, any particular area, any genre, be really specific in the thing that you love. And if you go ultra broad and just you know, focus on cars generally, it's not going to work. Even focusing on, you know, if you can focus on really specific types of trains, you're probably going to have better success. So just don't go broad, go, go narrow and focus on what you love. Cool. Um, Steve, what's the most transformative thing you've learned in the last six months? The most transformative thing I've learned in the last six months? Um, He's got a new baby at home, so it probably has to do with babies. Well, that's right. Oh, yeah, See? Sure, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, as far as the most transformative, I guess, um, Maybe transforming for our business. It's just the, the, the consistent fracturing of audiences and how quickly they're changing and adapting and moving to different platforms and moving around. Um, so definitely, I think the, the impact of short form on long form and long form on short form uh, and all the different dynamics that go with that. It's a strange thing on, on YouTube at the moment. It sort of seems like the mid form length doesn't work as well. So if you're looking at different combination factors of short form, mid form, long form, it seems like long form and short form work well, but mid form doesn't. It's just really sort of strange. You know, that's exactly things. what we're talking about at our workshop at two o'clock. So make sure you come when we talk about shorts and uh, long form and how they work together yeah. and the weird stuff. What about you, Alex? Yeah, so there's one, one creator I met who has completely changed my perspective on the algorithm. So there's a wonderful creator called Jordan Matter. I mean, you know him well. And what he said is that a lot of people blame the algorithm, right, when things don't work out. But he said the algorithm is the audience. Right. And he's like, every time something doesn't work, you have to remember, fundamentally, it's more likely that the algorithm may have changed, but it's the audience may have changed. What they're interested in, what they want. And that just changed my whole perspective, because if I stop blaming the algorithm, and I start focusing on the audience, then I actually take more insight from that. Why maybe they're less interested? What are they more interested in? And that, I think, changes your whole perspective to content. Yeah, I say that's related to what Steve says, so go ahead. I just wanted to add something that it's interesting, you know, the algorithm, I say the audience tells you what they want, the algorithm doesn't necessarily, because the algorithm changes all the time. I mean, we could saw like, uh, you know, across YouTube and Facebook, for example, or Facebook particularly, a month and a half ago, the algorithm decided to favor creators more than, more than traditional media entertainment. And so you saw a huge shift there and you had to adapt to that shift. So I think the audience tells you, but also the algorithm does whatever it wants to do, really. It depends upon the, motives, the, the, <laughs> the objectives of the platform. No, that's very true. I think the main essence I get from that is it's easy to blame external factors, right? right? Like algorithm change, I can't do it. But fundamentally, you can still see what, whether it resonates or not. Right? Look inside yourself. I think Correct. that's really good. Steve, what's your prediction about Twitter over the next 12 months? I don't know. I got blocked on Twitter like a year and a half ago. So, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, like Elon Musk is a pretty amazing guy. He, he definitely has transformed a lot of businesses. What he's going to do with this business, I'm not really quite sure. Right now, it doesn't look very promising. But I mean, so many people do rely on that platform to share their voice, it's, you know, to, to, to have that first-hand fly-on-the-wall experience with these people who they, who they follow and engage and participate with. And it's a great source of news and insight. So I don't think it's going to go away. But I, I think he may, he may create a whole new dynamic structure for, for social platforms. So who knows?
Alex, Twitter. What do we? I'm what do you think? So bullish on Twitter. Bullish. Why? Bullish. Okay, so I just want to take the last two weeks of my life. I'm, I'm not the average person because you know I'm I'm obviously into this space. But when the FTX scandal happened, where did I go for my news? I went to Twitter. When the World Cup, where did I go to check what was going on? I went to Twitter. Right. Twitter still has, I think, some form of monopoly on real-time news and insights. And I think as long as Elon Musk can keep that core and build out, I think it has a very bright future. And if you look at Twitter as a platform, there have not been many features that have been shipped over the last 10 years, and it's still thrived. So I'm really excited by what you know, a fresh pair of eyes can do to build on top. Well, define thrive. Thrive, make money? No. So <laughs> how's Twitter going to make money, Alex? So I think they're going to have to separate themselves from the advertisers. I think they're going to have to think about how they can monetize. That's directly. how they're making less money. How they're going to make more I know, money. I know, I know, I know. But I think it's, it's, it's a short-term pain for a long time. Now they're a private company. Yep. They don't have that scrutiny from shareholders as much as they did. I was very bullish on tokenization. I'm very bullish on tokenization. Yep. I think that separate the hype from NFTs you know, like, and, and crypto, but just think about what value it can provide to a creator. Um, I also think Shopify have talked a lot about how when you have different experiences coming together, you can do really interesting things through a token and the fact that it can be used in different platforms. So I'd, I think we, you know, we can move away from talking about the buzzword Web3, but I think that tokens in some form are going to live on. Well, that leads into my next one, unless you have a way for Twitter to make money, Steve. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's sort of interesting if you look at businesses like Spotify, who are subscription-based, mm. versus all the other social platforms who are most, you know, mostly you know, AVOD-based or you know, advertising-based. He could bring something interesting you know, yep. to the platform in the way and, and stabilize it and, and be able to reduce staff, reduce cost, and also do things a bit differently. But Jim, I'd like to know what you think of Twitter yeah, in 2023. Yeah. Uh, I think Twitter is going to fade into irrelevance. Ooh. Wow. Um, heard it here first. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, but then I'm not active on Twitter, so I have a lot of followers, but I don't go up there, so it's already irrelevant to me. Um, <laughs> what's next after social, Steve? What's next after social, and is this the end of social right here? Or is, there, or is, or is, is, is this the end of social, or is there something new coming? Uh, I, mean, I mean, everyone talks about, obviously about AR and VR. I think AR is going to be absolutely amazing. I'm very excited about how that's going to interact with our everyday world and how it'll you know, enable us to learn faster, yeah, you know, and, and just you know, rapidly, I guess, uh, improve as humans in general in everything that we do. Also, terrifying about being wired twenty four seven. But you know, social I think can be a part of that. You know, I think you know we're always going to be social. We're we're you know we're innately social humans. You know, without that social community environment, you know, it takes a village to raise a child scenario. You you it will cease to exist. So well, there will always be some sort of social part in every. Alex, what's next after social? Is this, is this the end or is there more? So more I come? think that social media is going to just become media, not social. It's just going to be our broadcasting. Yeah? yeah, but I think there'll be one, in one to two years' time, there'll be one truly social media platform left LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yep. I'm very bullish on LinkedIn. I think you're yep. also. Very hey, bullish. three o'clock, I'm going to talk about how you can grow on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for helping me with that plug. Okay, last question. If you were starting a channel today, where would you start it? Where would you start a channel today? I would start on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, okay. How about you? Where would you start your channel today? I would start a channel on TikTok about electric cars. Wow. All right, electric cars on TikTok. We're all going to drive away right now. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Steve. 